I've been asked to talk today on muscle strain injuries, particularly zooming in more at the at the tissue level and what implications our better understanding of that might have for our rehabilitation and its prognosis. I wish to declare no conflict of interest uh, and that I won't be discussing any off-label or unapproved use of drugs or products. And also to outline some learning objectives. The first of which is to look at the structural and functional complexity of uh, human triceps and sport. The second, to look at the radiological findings or some of the radiological findings and how they might guide our expectations and prognosis. And thirdly, to apply all this into formulating our rehabilitation with more specificity, if you like, and also to appreciate the particular knowledge gaps of which are plentiful in uh, what we do and don't understand within uh, tricep surrey. I'll be covering these elements of the relevant anatomy and we'll move into that right now. So the first thing to understand or to appreciate is the very large cross-sectional area or physiological cross-sectional area of soleus. And that's because of its uh, multi-pennate nature. And as you see here, it really dominates the um, proceedings as, as, as far as uh, cross-sectional area goes, as a result of which it produces around 80% of the overall force of the triceps surrey. Soleus is between 80 and 100% slow twitch fibers and gastroc about 50% or so. And, uh, and perhaps, this has greater implications than we probably appreciate to date. If we look at the complex nature, and those of you who've looked at uh, Soleus on ultrasound will appreciate uh, how complex it is and how difficult it is to understand. So Soleus is outlined in this series of slides, and this is taken from the uh, human or the visible human project. So Soleus is outlined in red here. We've got a bipennate anterior portion of which is often described as a muscle within a muscle. We see this anteriorly from this beautiful dissection by Paul Galano. The rest of the muscle is unipennate, uh, which whereby the fibres travel from the anterior ponurosis here back to the posterior ponurosis here. As we track down the soleus, we see that the central tendon here and the lateral and medial ponurosis actually open out to become more discrete uh, entities as opposed to this uh, the tube that we see more proximally here. And of course, we get down to the central tendon, which we then end up with this sort of T-junction uh, that most people appreciate when we get down closer to the insertion. The fibres have actually been, or fibre lengths have been studied uh, using uh, MRI. And in fact, this particular group, this is uh, Bosterley and also Rob Herbert from uh, University of uh, Sydney. Um, and they looked at taking soleus in MRI uh, through a range of 20 degrees plantar flexion through to about 18 degrees of, of dorsiflexion. So they were the first to actually take it through some portion of movement. It was about um, 11 mils change, so in the actual soleus length over that uh, period, over that range. The, the fascicle lengths of soleus are actually reasonably short, some 30 to 45 millimetres, which contrasts quite a bit with gastroc, which was around 60 millimetres or so. The anterior portion that I described before has lower pennation angles, angles and uh, Bostoli and, other, and their group actually described that it's geared much more towards sort of inner range excursion and certainly inner, inner range uh, plant flexion. Whereas the posterior compartment, 
which is around 80% of the overall cross-sectional area of Celeus, has larger pennation angles and more twist, and it appears to be geared much more towards high force production over small ranges of lengths. So this is the finding of this particular group. But when we look at the sorts of lengths that we do challenge our calf musculature with us, you, you wonder whether the design or call it what you will, is, is actually matched up to the, to the demands that we place Celeus and the calf musculature under. And uh, it, it's this we'll explore a little more throughout the lecture. There's considerable variability in the actual morphology uh, and the variants are as described. So we've got a normal Celeus here, and this is the work by Sekia, uh, a, a Japanese um, anatomist. So this is the normal Celeus where we've got this bipennate anterior structure here and the unipennate uni um, uh, remainder of Celeus. There are occasions where we see people with two of these bipennate structures or others who don't have any bipennate structures at all. This is in fact, if, if you like, an earlier form of the muscle where it hadn't differentiated into this particular entity. And we do see these variants in, in, in athletes uh, of the present day as well. The interesting thing is that of course, there's quite discrete nerve supply to the anterior portion and a different nerve supply to the posterior portion. That if you read very closely, as I have, the descriptions of nerve supply, there is no description of a nerve supply to the intramuscular aponeuroses, which I think is probably of some significance to us. Exploring this even further, Greg Lovell, a doctor I worked with, uh, and I actually decided, took it upon ourselves, if you like, to explore this a little further with a, a 23 gauge hypodermic needle and a willing participant. So if we pass the 23 gauge needle through the superficial fascia, of course, there's uh, some sensation with that. Let's call it three or four out of 10 in terms of discomfort, but then passing it through the soleus upon neurosis, there was in fact no sensory awareness of that structure as the needle passed through. Similarly, then we explored the anterior upon neurosis of soleus or the central tendon. And again, there was no real sensation of the nerve passing through these structures. So it really throws into some question as to how well innovated these are. And it may make us appreciate even better um, the fact that uh, some of the injuries that occur and some of the presentations where often they're quite severe injuries, but with no known history of onset, that might help reconcile that particular anomaly uh, as was brought up by uh, Tanya in her presentation. Another very interesting concept within the calf musculature is that of this described compartmentalized or functional compartmentalization of the muscles or subsets of the, uh, within these muscles and also their motor nerve supply. So this was described first of all by Bottoman who looked at the uh, lateral gastroc and then later by English who looked at uh, Celeus within, um, and these were in rats. And it really highlights the fact that we've got discrete areas within all of these muscles, which have their own motor nerve branch and they have their own discrete function. All of these sub compartments have their own discrete portion within the actual tendon that inserts ultimately at, at where it produces its action. 
So that uh, there's different differentiation within lateral gastroc, with soleus, and in fact, we probably know it best in the reasonably recent article by Schoenfeld who described that the proximal portion of hamstrings has more hip extensor function, the distal portion more a knee flexor function. This was in fact first described by Bottom in 1983 in looking at the uh, uh, biceps femoris of a cat. Uh, so this holds up a, a, a across different animals and, and of course uh, different muscles as we see here. So if we look at soleus with this or through this lens, that we need to appreciate that there are seven discrete regions of nerve supply within the soleus muscle. So effectively seven different uh, subcompartments, if you like. It appears that they've probably developed more to meet this uh, unipedal balance and, uh, and dynamic demands. That this was further explored by uh, Lowe in 2003. And he felt that there's the possibility that if there's a lack of synergy between these compartments, that that may contribute uh, to calf muscle tears or strain injury. So this is certainly something we should take on board and look at both greater specificity in our rehabilitation of medial lateral anterior posterior compartments and also perhaps the way we even prepare these uh, for uh, the particular sports and demands of particular sports. Looking at this even further is uh, appreciating better the bi biomechanical demands of the whole foot ankle system and this is well covered by Phil so I just want this to be excuse me, an overview. The first is to pre appreciate that pretty much all the biomechanical analyses have been done on hard surfaces. We do know that the calf attracts quasi isometrically and that, that the majority of energy production is from elastic recoil of the tendo Achilles. That obviously calf and Achilles experience the same features of both tensile forces and rate of loading, that these tensile forces are very high. They peak at 11 or 12 body weights, certainly from the work of lie. Uh, but also we see very high loading rates at sprinting speeds of anything up to 250 body weights a second. That that the peak absorption occurs within the first 20th of a second or so. So again, these exceptionally high body weights. We talk a lot of triceps surae, yet there is a smaller contribution of around 25% from the other plantar flexor muscles being FHL, FDL and uh, tibialis posterior. Alluding to this compartmentalization, if you like, we also need to consider the off axis loads in particular field sports. And I'll, I'll uh, talk about that a little bit later. And lastly, to consider from the recent work by Kotsafaki, who's a biomechanist at, at Aspatar, that the horizontal uh, hopping produces a great, significantly greater demand on ankle power and work than as does uh, vertical hopping. So in fact, we need to consider that much more significantly in our rehabilitation as you will have seen from Phil's presentation as well. Although we know that most of the work to date has been done on hard surfaces, what of soft surfaces, what do we know? Some of what we know is that running on hard, on soft surfaces, we see a loss of elastic recoil of the Achilles, and we see a significantly increase, a significant increase in calf activation, that it's really much more concentric contraction as opposed to elastic recoil that provides a lot of our, our drive. A number of authors have described an increase in leg and calf stiffness on soft surfaces. And uh, this is work by Ferris. Uh, there's also work by Farley. In fact, I think she was um, part of this um, 
uh, uh, work as well. So they looked at very soft surfaces, you know, 15 degrees of foam and running on that as opposed to stiffer surfaces. And of course, they found that there was an increase in leg stiffness to stop the collapsing of the body centre of mass. And so these are, this is something that's uh, very well known um, as uh, is the work that shows that running in softer shoes or with softer inner soles actually produces this paradoxical increase in leg stiffness and possibly calf stiffness too. What we don't know is what's happening in this newer generation of energy returning shoes. And so there are a number of questions still out there with what's happening when we run on soft surfaces. In particular, uh, it's also thought that there's probably much more co-contraction of the muscles uh, occurring here than occurs in more just sagittal plane running. There's a lot we don't understand with respect to what happens intrinsically within the calf. We've got this great finite element uh, modeling of the hamstring complex, but we don't really have quite the same within calf, but I will show you some of what's out there. We do have a significant disconnect between symptoms and pathology. And you'll recall from Tanya's excellent presentation that around 50% of injuries have no discernible number one. Uh, mechanism, but is this due to this lack of uh, sense, sensory innovation in the deeper calf as well? Also, we see multiple sites of failure being reported. You remember back to Tanya's presentation, and there are in fact a great raft of different uh, possibilities or probabilities uh, when we consider. Uh, various rec, rec, um, risk factors and possible mechanisms. And, and so it's quite possible that there are multiple paths to failure uh, that we should be considering rather than perhaps just a singular one. Whatever it may be, it's without doubt, it's most probably the fact that we've got a high tensile load or loading rates in combination with 3D link chain challenges. And this is pretty much in common with uh, what we consider as happening within the hamstring muscle group. We can't discount things such as high loading rates as uh, proposed by Comey or local muscle fatigue as opposed by Mayer or this lack of synergy in the different uh, components within the soleus muscle as proposed by Lowe and the other etiological factors as uh, Tanya's presented. If we go back and uh, try and gain a greater appreciation both of load and loading rates of the calf, and uh, I have played this card or this slide uh, many times just to take you through it once again. So if we look at things such as a, a vertical hop or running at three and a half, uh, five, seven and nine metres a second at, low, at the tensile forces placed on the calf. So this is the red uh, histogram here, we see uh, progress from around 6.2 body weights at the calf Achilles complex, peaking at, at around double that, around 12 uh, body weights in running at seven metres a second, actually drops away a little bit at the highest speeds. If we look at loading rates, however, uh, that whether we're hopping or running very slowly, that's very similar uh, loading rates of the calf Achilles complex, which raises asymptotically as we uh, run to up towards sprinting speeds. The big feature to appreciate here is that if we do a calf raise in a Smith machine with 60 kilograms, so close to body weight uh, within the gym, that really that's only about a third of the way towards meeting the rate of loading demands that we're placing on the Achilles, calf Achilles complex um, in either very slow running or hopping. So quite clearly our rehabilitation's got to consist of multiple increments taking us from this slow loading here, uh, introducing 
uh, plyometric, pulsing and plyometric type activities to take us all the way up to even matching the demands of slow running and then ultimately to fast running. Now, I alluded to Finney's work earlier and uh, Finney and Hodgson a little later examined the calf performing an isometric contraction at 40% MVC in an MRI. At, but this is fixed, if you remember, in plantar grade. What they showed is quite modest changes within the soleus fascia here. So the proximal portion of the soleus fascia actually lengthens around 2% or so. It's quite a stiff structure, as I've, uh, I will mention again later. Uh, whereas distally, it actually shortens a little bit. But this is because the calf muscle, or soleus, in fact, swells and broadens. And in fact, being a three-dimensional structure, it actually stiffens a little bit longitudinally. The really interesting thing, if we mine his work even deeper, is you'll see actually very little differential movement in the intramuscular aponeuroses of soleus uh, both the medial aponeurosis and the lateral aponeurosis here. We need to understand the features of activated aponeurosis uh, a little better. First is that if we look at the intramuscular tendon, effectively it's formed by the interweaving of the terminal perimysium of the muscle fibres. So uh, they're being woven together here to form this intramuscular tendon plus a deposition of some type 1 and type 3 collagen here. There are fibroblasts that help uh, to lay this down, whereas the proteoglycans of this particular intramuscular tendon pretty much aren't described that we can find to date. Similar to what we saw in the soleus aponeurosis, that the intramuscular tendon strains very little. It's only around 2% or so. And in fact, uh, of course, as the muscles contract, they actually tension this intramuscular tendon even more. So it's a little stiffer as well. It does adapt to training that we see that uh, over a period of around six months to two years, we see that these chronic loads lead to some adaptive stiffening. And this is somewhat reversible too. So that if we unload a, an intramuscular aponeurosis or, or tendon uh, for a period of, uh, certainly over a period of weeks to months, that we see a loss of stiffness too. So in fact, it is somewhat reversible. So it's, it's um, trainable both ways. What we don't know, we see from the work of Ryan Timmons and others that um, there appears to be some change in fascicle length with uh, eccentric exercise and, and others. But we don't know whether this induces, as this tissue lengthens, whether in fact there is a change in the stiffness properties uh, associated with that. And this is a, one of a series of unknowns, as I alluded to at the start of the lecture, within our understanding of intramuscular tendon. So the second part of the lecture is what imaging pro, uh, changes or what are the imaging findings uh, out there with relation to calf muscle injuries? What do we know about them and um, how might it change things that we um, approach within rehabilitation? So just looking at these briefly, uh, again, you'll know a lot of these. So Delgado looked very much at tennis leg. So it was very much that medial gastroc insertion. And he found that medial gastroc was far more involved than plantaris. It was only the later work of Kalouris looking at um, high level athletes really that uh, highlighted very much the soleus involvement that something like 60% um, uh, I think of calf muscle injuries involved the soleus uh, muscle complex. This was further uh, reinforced by the work of Baileus, um, who showed an even higher percentage. And he introduced to us uh, the cilia anatomy, which had actually been identified, as you saw uh, previously, uh, by Finney and um, Hodgson in their earlier work. 
but of course, he highlighted the fact that uh, the salial strains tended to occur in and around these intramuscular tendons within salias. Pedret uh, picked up on this, um, and of course, these are co-authors, and uh, identified more the, the features of site specificity, age, uh, intramuscular or intramuscular tendon edema and retraction were all features that uh, uh, in a multifactorial approach were, were probably of most importance to uh, un better understanding the, the prolonged rehabilitation interval associated with uh, a number of these injuries. He found that the central uh, tendon, uh, this central tendon uh, identified here, had the worst prognosis. Prakash took this a little further and identified that the degree to which the intramuscular tendon in, was involved, so that is uh, more a serious involvement of this structure identified with a greater rehabilitation interval. And uh, uh, that lastly was taken further again by uh, Tanya and, uh, and Brady Green, uh, who demonstrated that two things. First of all, is that the, um, this medial or central tendon was perhaps less uh, an identifiable feature that it appeared to be spread across all the uh, different aponeuroses or, or intramuscular tendons as we appreciate them. Uh, and also, it wasn't just the involvement of the intramuscular tendon, but also the feature of its combination of, of onset with running were the things, the great features that we needed to be aware of. And I've stolen a little bit, uh, with her permission, of Tanya's slide here. So the thing to appreciate also is that across these intramuscular tendon injuries, be it medial, central or, or lateral intramuscular uh, tendon, is that there is a huge range. So are those that actually um, uh, rehabilitate within quite a reasonable timeline. And then there are others, uh, these um, uh, who may, may suffer uh, one or more recurrences or are just very slow to regain uh, their function. And the, lastly, the thing is that uh, the presenting sites symptoms appear to be no reflection to the ultimate pathology that we might see on radiology. So what appears to be important uh, and talking both to radiologists and also to um, uh, physicians and others who see many of these, that, that the main three or four features um, uh, from a radiological point of view are involvement of the um, intramuscular tendon or the anterior gastroc aponeuroses, the loss of continuity of these aponeuroses, a feature of redundancy or waviness within uh, uh, certainly the, the longitudinal views of the, um, uh, of the intramuscular tendon, some signal within the intramuscular tendon and also the possibility of a confounder of uh, perforating vessels. And so one of the things that we do, and these are the perforating vessels that we see here, there's three or four perforating vessels, excuse me, of the medial aponeurosis, and there's three or four perforating vessels of the lateral aponeurosis. And not uncommonly that the lesions that we see occurring occur in and around that particular level, which have led some to consider whether or not there may be an intrinsic weakness within the aponeurosis at that level. Often it confounds our diagnosis uh, as well. You'll see from uh, Phil's I, uh, slide, again, I stole one of his slides too. Uh, and again, um, this highlighted both factors um, of aponeurosis, aponeurotic disruption, as you see here, but also a number of the features that Tanya introduced in her, um, in her work as well. Um, and again, I'm... Um, violently agreeing with uh, both uh, Tanya's work and also um, as presented by Phil earlier. Uh, 
another one, uh, again, I've alluded to this earlier, that uh, the gastroxyleus um, uh, junction is of particular interest and particular challenge to us. And there are also these epimysial uh, lesions, which are rare. So what does what do we know about aponeurotic involvement? It's still contentious, uh, as we understand, within hamstring injuries. So there are those that are able to, uh, I guess, survive these or cope with these and are able to continue uh, and rehabilitation. Their rehabilitation is only modestly increased where there are others who have real difficulty. So Common's earliest work um, identified uh, in the fact that um, involvement of the intramuscular tendon in the group predominantly of AFL footballers um, uh, led to an increased rehabilitation interval and an increased recurrence. Uh, the uh, very large cohort uh, by um, Anna van der Maid and Gus Roerink um, showed that there was only a modest increase in um, their um, in their rehabilitation interval and no real increase in recurrence. Um, they have a very rigorous approach to their rehabilitation with uh, lots of early running. Um, maybe this is a feature, maybe the, the more diverse nature of their uh, their cohort may be a contributor, and this is something we're still trying to reconcile uh, to date. Most recently, a, a single AFL club uh, looked at 41 hamstring injuries, and they again found an increase in return to play times across all of their uh, slightly different grading, um, and also an increase in, in uh, re-injury in those with intramuscular tendon involvement as opposed to uh, not, but in fact, that didn't reach significance within their, um, in fact, it was really underpowered within this study. So one of the, uh, probably one of the most recent hamstring studies, which I think is of real interest to us, is that of Vermeulen. And here we look at essentially what's happening to the intramuscular tendon um, as, um, as people are returning to play. And I think there's some elements within this that are very are real value to us when we look at the calf complex. So what they did is they MRI'd them, obviously at baseline within seven days, and then uh, MRI'd them again just prior to return to play. What they did find, and their mean return to play is 31 days that um, only 18 of 34 of the uh, intramuscular tendons had become a partial tear as uh, within intramuscular tendon had become continuous. Six of seven of their complete tears had then become partially, uh, partially healed. They showed a, a loss of waviness, so this degree of redundancy, if you like, um, from 61% of the um, original um, partial and complete tears down to 12%. And notably, 88% of the intramus those of those tears that involved the intramuscular tendon had become thickened. So we're seeing, and this mirrors um, discussions and what we're seeing uh, as we consult with uh, many other uh, physicians and radiologists uh, in this area. And so at 31 days, um, and most people will tell you, say six to eight weeks, we're starting to see pretty good healing, pretty loss, pretty much our loss of any intramuscular tendon um, healing signal and um, we're starting to feel more confident about that tissue being able to bear load. If we contrast that with the sort of um, uh, very slow healing that's described by Jaspers, who looked at um, a poneurotomy of the, uh, of the gastroc um, or of the calf complex in a rat, and the fact that took somewhere between six months to two years. I think this Vermeulen study actually gives us the best insight into the way these intramuscular tendon um, 
tendons do heal. So, of course, they're not completely healed at 31 days. That much is sure. Um, a lot of them survive. That much is sure to within the um, within the hamstring. Of course, there are less synergists. There's probably less la lateral transmission of forces described by Hing. Uh, that we might consider. But of course, we're getting some insight into the healing that's occurring at a reasonably young period uh, of time, that is 31 days. So this six to eight weeks is now becoming, um, I, I guess, a reasonable sort of uh, guideline for us. Um, and of course, there are those who survive and who are able to um, return before that when we're talking of calf injury also. Uh, this is just a summary slide of uh, Prakash's um, cohort. Here we see uh, 63 of these involve the intramuscular tendon. He has slightly different grading to BAMIC. I've tried to align them. They don't ally, uh, uh, align exactly, but it's more just to give a little more translation between the two rating, uh, radiological rating systems. The big thing is that um, these huge ranges, as we see here, that people can suffer a, a, a grade two to three C or, or their grade two uh, and pretty much go out and play. So again, you know, is the lack of sensation part of this as well as their ability to cope. So there were soleus injuries. If we look at gastroc, these are, these are a real challenge to us. And this is the, um, uh, the insertion of this terminal phase of gastroc connective tissue onto the soleus aponeurosis. If we look at the marvellous uh, anatomical work done by Blitz and Elliot, we see that, in fact, the area of this insertion is actually only about as big as a postage stamp, both for the lateral gastroc and the medial gastroc. And so if we do have injuries here that involve often uh, intratendinous uh, tearing or cleaving of the soleus aponeurosis and or separation of the gastroc aponeurosis and or muscle involvement. So the features of this are identified earliest by Delgado but also much later, um, uh, Prakash showed them to be quite a difficult injury. And also Padrette has a very recent um, ultrasound study too. So these are sort of a, uh, an orange flag or red flag injury in that not uncommonly they lose their symptoms reasonably early, that is at two or three weeks. Uh, they seem reasonably innocuous, um, but often suffer multiple multiple occurrences because of course the connective tissue healing here is quite unforgivable and we look at the length demands in some of these sports that's probably a contributor to to the recurrences. Uh, we also have a fairly unique injury uh, which I've only seen once or twice which is in essence a sort of almost an epimysial injury where the, the proximal portion of gastroc is torn away from its, its origin. Here, you see this here on cross-section. This one actually uh, um, was managed with uh, multiple evacuations uh, and use of PRP, I think it was, to help, um, uh, uh, to help clue up this particular injury. And uh, over time, it was quite slow to resolve, but in fact, uh, ultimately did. We've also seen an epimysial tear. This was the initial MRI in the distal soleus too. So, of course, we should be seeing uh, uh, T2. This is a T2. So, of course, the injury is here. And it was, in fact, hidden. So it was a bit of a sleeper in the early phases of its in injury. And in fact, it was only after two or three recurrences at some, at around 40 days or so that it became apparent that in fact on axial view, that the, a large part of the footprint of the insertion of this soleus, and in fact, uh, this was uh, slightly different to the, the normal morphology of soleus. This was almost a purely 
unipenate soleus, as I described in, in the earliest anatomical studies. If we look at the affected side against the normal side, again, you're seeing quite a significant rent here and a, a, a easily identifiable epimysial injury. This was again managed with uh, multiple fenestration and uh, PRP into the area uh, and very slow progressive uh, mobilization. In fact, did well over time, but it was uh, uh, quite a significant time to return to play. So the challenge for us uh, and one of the questions has been, uh, is there a place for adjunct interventions? And first of all, uh, within the intramuscular tendon, uh, we need to consider whether there's an intact scaffold around it. So these are, appear to be somewhat different from um, injuries of the proximal hamstring where we can see quite significant uh, uh, quite significant disruption and and with significant retraction of the injury, we tend not to see really long retractions of the injury within uh, because only part of the intramuscular tendon is actually affected. So there is this sort of scaffold around it, which is both the contractile tissue of uh, the, uh, the of the muscle itself as well as the uh, intramuscular tendon in parallel with it too so generally i would propose that uh, normally mechanical loading is sufficient to actually see a normalization of this uh, this retraction over a period of, of weeks and i think there's less real demand for or consideration for biologics. Whereas I, I think in the epimysial strains where we're seeing a tearing away of this footprint, um, normal footprint of insertion, that they take an awful long while to heal it. Often with muscle contraction, you're continually um, uh, pulling apart what, where we're trying to get healing. We, we've also seen a, um, a split in the anterior ponderosis, when, which in, in uh, functionally is the same as an epimysial injury. Again, this was continually um, uh, recurring. So things such as either multiple um, uh, fenestration or biologics or eccentrics probably uh, have their best place uh, in trying to manage these particular injuries. We should remind ourselves of the differential diagnoses of uh, calf musculature uh, injuries. So uh, the tiny little plantaris tendon, which is no thicker than a piano wire in uh, in in most uh, most athletes, but of course we see ruptures here, and uh, which can mimic a uh, medial gastroc or soleus. Uh, strains of the FHL, which are not uncommonly missed, um, uh, it, it originates from around the fibula, uh, the body of the fibula itself, and of course we've got things such as sural nerves, DVTs, popliteal arteries. Uh, I'll just put that in for completeness, but without any further discussion. So what are the implications of all this for, um, for our early rehabilitation? So Phil talked uh, beautifully uh, about late rehabilitation. So I just want to uh, complement that with uh, some of our applications in early rehabilitation. So in the medial and lateral aponeurosis, it's probably about early protection. Um, our bias of our strength loads more towards overall in um, activation involvement of the uh, of the soleus and gastroc muscle tendon units, and then becoming more and more specific to the particular area of injury or that subcompartment within the muscle. That we might start with uh, length protection and um, and then go to short range stimuli and then uh, actually promoting this short range sort of stimuli where we're actually uh, trying to stimulate mechanical loading of the intramuscular tendon itself. And uh, lastly, we see this introduction of um, activities prior to running and then progression to normal running and off-axis running. <clears throat> 
If we look at gastroc, uh, insertion is going to be, a, be about initial length protection early, then uh, perhaps along with soleus bias, because of course, um, a lot of our soleus work doesn't need to, uh, in effect, uh, challenge this area. And then we can graduate to more uh, gastroc strengthening at protected lengths, then uh, to longer lengths as well, and then get to faster stimuli at longer lengths. Lastly, uh, I've alluded to this within epimysial injuries, initial protection, inner range maintenance and strength, plus or minus uh, whatever interventions you might want to introduce. Then perhaps the utility of things such as DOMS inducing eccentric bouts to stimulate more adhesion molecules through this, um, through this junction here, and then graduating our bias and loading more towards that area of the muscle. Parallel rehabilitation, and again, this was all work that was produced, by, uh, sorry, introduced by Phil. So we look at things internal to the triceps, such as meeting the tensile load demands, the rate of load demands, strength endurance, and connective tissue integrity. Beyond that, we look at connective chain considerations, such as ankle and foot function, shoe service considerations, synergy, within the, the shank and also uh, the rest of the kinetic chain too, so proximodistal, distoproximal uh, energy contributions. Phil introduced this slide and I'll talk to it just briefly. Uh, I think what we've <coughs> tried to show here, we're looking at the rate of loading of the tissues. And I think I showed to you earlier that we've got relatively high rates as we look to increase our running speed. So this is mine from Dawn's work. If we look at early work, we showed that slow work done within the gym um, is a long way short of what we need in fast running. But of course, things like dynamic sled push, uh, submaximal hops, forward hops, accelerations are all approximate the sort of uh, high body weight loads of running. So what to put in between? So we can use things such as pulses of uh, both double leg and single leg pulses, and then progress that to um, faster rates of pulsing and things plyometric type activities like double leg jumps. Uh, and we can then bias it, of course, um, to higher rates, uh, higher rates, that is higher frequencies of loading, and then we can bias it more to the, the side. So we can use the same principles for looking at the whole muscle, or we can look at biasing it more towards specific components. And this is what I wanted to introduce to you here. So we talked earliest about components of the lateral calf or the medial calf. And so we can perform the same principle. So we can look at biasing exercises more towards the lateral portion of calf by hanging the fourth and fifth met off a bit of um, uh, varus at the knee and look to perform pulses of just um, the lateral portion on the so we can do heel raises in a Smith machine first, I beg your pardon, um, and we'll look to the pulses later. So slow loading in Smith machine for the lateral portion. We can look at slow loading to get to the medial soleus, but the thing about getting to medial soleus is having the first ray off the weight plate as they're performing their Smith machine activities. In this way, we found greater localization of medial soleus and it takes the FHL out of the equation. We can do more slow loading by doing external rotation and varus to get lateral soleus or internal rotation and a bit of valgus and then a twist as well to get more of medial soleus. So this is this is slow loading. These are all slow loading approaches, which will complement the early gym activity. And then we'll go to the faster loading. So the faster loading, as, as I showed on you originally, we can hang off the edge of 
a step, small step here, fourth and fifth off the first step and do pulses to bias the lateral compartment of soleus and the lateral aponeurosis, or we can hang the medial side off and hang the first ray off to then bias the medial aponeurosis of soleus in our pulsing type maneuvers. We then wanted to take that further to hopping by using a band resistance, as you see here, we get excellent activation of both perineals and lateral soleus compartments by hopping, oh, hand yeah, was a, <laughs> hopping against a, um, a, a band at 45 degrees, as you saw there. And then to get the medial aponeurosis, obviously we've just reversed it to the other side and you'll see repeated hopping here. Again, this is a real burner for the medial calf aponeurosis. So these are all useful means of being of taking this uh, these progressions much further in terms of our rehabilitation. Now I alluded to the fact and I, I uh, of using eccentrics to. Uh, to help assist our adhesion mechanisms in people who have uh, either recurrent intramuscular tendon problems or um, epimysial issues as well. And so here, and I, I um, uh, credit to Per Agard, um, who first introduced me to this con concept. So some very good articles out there of showing that eccentrics actually stimulate adhesion mechanisms um, within the myotendinous unit. And, and of course, we do know that they're used to stimulate fascia lengthening as well. You know, ideally induce DOMS on a couple of occasions, um, um, generally uh, around seven to ten, five to seven days between each induction of a DOMS period. The important thing to know is that DOMS, when we have the actual DOMS itself, that that corresponds with an increase in tenacin C. Tenacin C is a de-adhesion molecule associated with remodeling the actual myotendinous units. So the important thing is no high loading due that, during that period. So that is no running with DOMS, essentially. I think it's something that most people are aware of already. So when to introduce this sort of um, concept, it has to be early in the rehab before running. So generally after your protective phase, so somewhere in that first four to six, six weeks and once they have the range. And it really is of greater consideration with the recurrent injuries, as I said earlier. So uh, more your intramus recurrent intramuscular tendon or epimysial injuries. So there's an individual uh, decision taken by the management team on when to use it. And um, uh, often it assists also uh, with our active lengthening. How would you do it? So we can do the passive uh, walking backwards on a treadmill. Generally, you actually put the this uh, the leg that's not being worked on the side of the treadmill, and it's it's a, it's a singular uh, riding the treadmill back on the affected side, um, and you'll do say multiples of uh, three by 30 steps uh, to really try and induce uh, DOMS of gastroxylase complex. The other way is walking down multiple steps of stairs, catch the elevator up. Um, in one of our cases, he did um, 10 flights of stairs 10 times. Um, it's that sort of volume that's required. Then, of course, they have to get over the DOMS and then repeat it again. We can supplement this with uh, work to actually get to the gastroc insertion. So things such as backwards on a treadmill, as you saw before, uh, prowler on stretch, or of course we can do a lowering and lengthening as in a Smith machine okay, that you'll, you'll see here. Uh, so again, lowering at length. And this was we, of all the options we worked through, this seemed to be our best option in terms of control. 
Um, of course, another one is using a buddy walking backwards this way. You can go neutral, then you can bias it more to the lateral side or you can bias it more to the medial side as well. Okay. The other thing we need to consider is that not to be just looking at the calf complex for our rehabilitation, but also looking at energy sharing across the kinetic chain. So we know both in uh, running and in jumping, we get a contribution from the proximal musculature. So we need to consider in running and jumping both the distal proximal and proximo distal energy transmission of the two joint muscles. And the work done there shows that about 30% of the um, ultimate, of what's ultimately delivered uh, through to the foot actually comes from the proximal musculature. We've also got this inverted pendulum, mass pendulum, or, or inverted spring mass uh, type system, which we need to consider too. So it's the body's mass working against spring which um, obviously provides a lot of generation for your elastic recoil. So that's one concept. The other concept, of course, is, as I said, this contribution of proximal muscles. And we see this in running where we know from the work of Shack and Dawn that as running speed increases, so does the um, relative contribution of the proximal muscles. Um, so that becomes um, a big player as we get to sprint speeds. The other thing we know is that in multi-directional um, unanticipated movements, there's much more in the way of co-contraction. So our other muscles will come in there too, uh, both of the um, of the shank, but also higher up in the um, um, in our proximal muscles as well. What is of interest is if we look at uh, fatiguing muscle. Um, uh, contractions and there's a, a couple of different studies that looked at fatiguing muscle contractions in uh, jump and shuttle run activities or being done on an inclined uh, on an inclined sled. Now both of the studies actually showed that uh, the greater fatigue and the greater variability, the greater ranges of motion as one fatigues occurs over the hip and over the knee that in fact, um, the body seems to look to maintain at all costs the stiffness and ultimate delivery <clears throat> from the calf muscle, muscle complex. So it appears then when we look at fatigue as a factor and we consider it is, of course, we need strength endurance within the calf, but we probably also need to consider strength endurance of our more proximal musculature as well. I'll leave you to read the articles and um, uh, um, make your own assumptions around that. So, of course, we do a lot in strength endurance in terms of the high impulse, you know, force by time, things such as sled pushes, four sets of 20. Um, uh, and I like to see 20 reps on the right leg first, then turn around 20 reps on the back leg. So that way we're getting a, a true lactate out of the muscles. Evan asked me to talk to you also on this uh, VEX question of when can I run, when, when can I play? So if we go briefly through the sort of milestones we might consider, and Phil alluded to this uh, also. So we've got, we've got a tensile demand depending on the level of support that we're going to require of those athletes. Phil alluded um, and he used things like plus two body weights in a standing Smith machine for his rugby players. And of course, for elite sports people in um, uh, highly explosive sports that we would use pretty much the same. Whereas for your recreational runner, it's probably of the order of point plus 0.8 body weight. So 60 kilograms, 65 kilograms for an 80 kilogram runner, that sort of thing. Now, often they don't need to achieve this before they can start that pre-running activity like, um, you know, the little pulses and runs and hops and other things. But I think the interim is about 80% of uh, that target, but the ultimate is actually achieving this prior to their return to sport. 
but to return to or being able to undertake our prep to run drills, I'm happy with about 80% of that. To exit the prep to run drills, so that is the pulses and plyos and skips and drills, I like to see them being able to do 10 vertical hops up onto a step each leg and then 10 vertical hops each leg, jumping and landing. And, and the main thing is that we look assessing for equal weight distribution and no compensation between legs. And then 10 or multiples of submaximal hops. And the like, I like to see two or three reps of three per leg, um, as I'll show you here. And you remember back to the Cotter Fox uh, article that, uh, in fact, this is a greater demand on the calf musculature than what vertical hops is. So we've gone from a vertical propulsive activity to vertical um, storage and elastic of elastic energy to then a horizontal. So that's that's why we um, graduated in this way. So again, performing three hops either side, submaximally, but in fact, it's close to a maximal demand on the calf musculature. So what we're doing is comparing left to right, looking for any compensations there. If they can do that, they uh, will then progress from there to start their running, generally done as multiples of run-throughs at slower paces, graduating, graduating to faster paces, ultimately to whatever pace that they need to return to their sport in. We like to see, obviously, to see um, uh, a reasonable degree of healing and remodeling in the intramuscular tendons if they've been involved. So that necessitates two to six weeks of running. Um, and you've got historical benchmarks for that. For higher levels of sport, they've got things such as agility challenges, multi-directional multi um, uh, uh, challenges, functional training drills, and then progressing further to accelerations, decelerations. All of this was um, uh, covered very, very impeccably by, by Phil earlier. So uh, I'm just, um, I guess, adding a little bit to that and in the way of, of how you might look to assess it, etc. cetera. Um, again, getting back to what we might consider in terms of demands on the medial compartment at length, which you see both here and here. So there are quite considerable length demands that we need to look to rehabilitate these people back, back to as well. So it's important that um, whichever means you want to approach it, that we're going to need to get back to challenging something like the demands that some of these players undergo as they return to play. So in summary, I trust that I've been able to bring to you an understanding of the complexity of the functional anatomy of, of triceps surae, of an appreciation of the different subcompartments and how we might need to then be more pedantic around the way we both appreciate the original injury, but also how we might need to better prepare people to uh, minimise the, um, the recurrences that we sometimes see in these injuries. That there may be multiple paths to failure in these, um, the, the really diverse presentations of these. Um, and then that we've got um, some real, uh, quite specific features around the recurrent injuries as well that I hope between what I've tried to introduce to you here, as well as uh, in combination with Phil's excellent lecture, that uh, we might have been able to give you a more complete um, appraisal of the things to consider, both in the early uh, uh, periods of rehabilitation, as well as later. So just to reiterate, going through that protective period, through just quite specific um, um, approaches to loading early and then mid phase and then ultimately meeting the muscle strength, rate of force and length demands. Considering 
also the contributions of the synergists both within the shank as well as across the kinetic chain. Again, considering as well the fatigue resistance considerations and whatever things you might need to um, uh, discuss around specificity of, of surface and uh, and ensuring that they're exposed to the sorts of um, uh, challenges that they're going to be exposed to as they return to sport. Lastly, I think we need to <laughs> Um, acknowledge the very many uh, knowledge gap, gaps that we get challenged with. And, um, and so uh, with that, I thank you and I thank the organising committee for uh, this wonderful opportunity and again for the wonderful series that they presented to you. So uh, again, uh, my thanks and I'll bid you adieu.